Research is at the heart of what the college does. So um, we're sitting in a river valley here, obviously, we're standing on top of a river. We've also got emerging pictures of a certain amount of migration within what is now England. So people moving around in this part of, of, of Britain. And a, a large Saxon brooch came up and uh, that was kind of the first moment when we were like, yes, they're going to be Saxon. Well, it goes a long way back. In one sense, the origin of this particular dig could be dated to the 1930s, which is the rough date of the accommodation buildings at the Croft Garden site on the Barton Road, which are owned by the college. And for a long time, it had been thought that these weren't really viable for the either the late 20th or the certainly the 21st century. And so the college had plans to demolish them and put up new buildings. Wow. Okay. So Croft Gardens is a site that was known to have uh, an early medieval cemetery already in the 19th century. Um, when that part of Newnham, wa Newnham was built and that the, the sort of houses went in on the Barton Road, there were sporadic finds of, uh, of both uh, cinerary cremation urns and and also graves. So when the the buildings came down, an extensive uh, campaign of scientific archaeology was put in place last summer. So in in 2020, we initially went to Croft Gardens in 2014, and we did a series of trial trenches, which are a smaller hole, sort of taking a little peek at what might be there and we didn't initially find a huge amount. There was a little bit of uh, Roman archaeology possibly and a little bit of Iron Age. And then when they pulled the buildings down, we came back and we put in some more trial trenches just where the buildings had been. And it was in one of these trenches that we first came across the skeletons, basically. Some sites we might do trial trenching and find absolutely nothing. Um, so we were pretty excited to find some Saxon remains in this one. The archaeology undertaken in this commercial context has revealed um, a fairly extensive cemetery of the early medieval period, of the early Anglo-Saxon period. But broadly speaking, what we've got is a cemetery of, um, of everyday people, of people like you and me. And Corinna Duhigg has been doing preliminary analysis of the skeletal remains. So she's identified about 68 individuals. There are some graves that are clearly in secondary depositions, which means that, that, um, that bodies or bones were removed from a grave and put into a collection um, so that the grave could be reused. We've got a rural population. So we've got people who are probably working the land nearby. Um, we've got a, a range of men and women and sub-adults. We've got some, some infants and children as well, although not a huge number. And we've got a, a lot of people who are buried with grave goods. And what that means is that people, people's corpses were put into the ground in clothes and wearing buckles and clasps that held together their cloaks. And they're often buried with um, swords or with spears or, um, or, or pots and, and with glass vessels as well sometimes. And so one of the things that's, that's most exciting about analyzing an Anglo-Saxon period cemetery is to analyze and determine and ask questions about what the relationship between the individuals and the objects is what the objects tell us about the aspirations of the people who buried their loved ones, what they tell us about how people marked status and gender and uh, profession in lifetimes, and, and what the ideas and expectations of the afterlife might be based on what people went into the grave with. 
The one unusual element to the Croft Garden site is that the, there is a handful of graves that are unfurnished and stone lined. So, so there's this kind of pattern of stones around the body. Um, and those are the ones that we think might well be late Roman because that's a, more of a fourth century tradition. So that's one of the things, the first things to get radiocarbon dated to see if it actually has a fourth century date as opposed to a fifth or a sixth century date. If it's got a fifth or a sixth century date, that's really interesting because that's a, a, a type of burial that we wouldn't normally expect to find in that particular century. The interesting things that this site should tell us are firstly what we really do know about the Cambridge area in this period and so kind of the first sort of modern excavation, modern scientific analysis that we can do on one of these populations so that's going to be really useful. Um, I think one of the most interesting things is going to be this question of did it start in the fourth century and is there a break? So is this a period of um, a place where people were buried once and then not buried and then people came back to bury and why was that so if, if it was the case or, or was this always a, a place of, of known burial that people just kept revisiting. In 2018 we launched the King's Campaign, the intention of which is to raise £100 million to further the uh, purposes of the college which uh, we state as being education, religion, learning and research. And that campaign was kicked off magnificently with a, a gift of over 33 million pounds from a King's alumnus. And the very specific purpose of that gift was to put up new accommodation for our students uh, and in particular on the Croft Garden site, accommodation for graduate students uh, and for married or partnered students and young fellows also with families, which is a kind of accommodation that the college has not been uh, well able to provide uh, historically. Uh, so in a way, it, 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 it starts from an outdated series of buildings and more recently, a very, very generous gift to the college with a very specific educational purpose behind it. As archaeologists, although it's not all about finding brooches and beads and gold, you know, a lot of a lot of what we do is just finding um, mud and pottery. <laughs> For me, uh, like burials, it might sound a bit morbid, but they're they're always fascinating, and they're always uh, you kind of feel more of a, a connection with that period. Particularly if someone's buried with belongings, it's um, it's great, and also you know that excavation is just going to be the first stage of what's going to be a really interesting project. So there are two different sorts of isotopic analysis. One that gives you an indication of childhood origin and another that gives you indications of diet through somebody's life. And this is basically the principle that your bones and your teeth take on a, a background chemical signature of the things that you're eating and drinking. Um, so in terms of uh, childhood origin, we would analyse people's um, tooth enamel and um, we would have a look at their oxygen and their strontium isotopes to get an indication of whether they were people who spent their childhood in this broad location or whether they seem to have spent their childhood somewhere else and then see if we can work out where that somewhere else might have been. So that's something I'm particularly interested in looking at because that's a field that's really developing and we're still trying to make sense of that data. So it, it's only very, very recently that people have been able to extract DNA from human skeletal remains in, and, um, and reconstruct the sequence. But there are several kind of new fields of research that are emerging from this. Um, one is about trying to understand uh, relationships within a community. So um, about paternity and about family relationships. And so this becomes extremely interesting when we're looking at an Anglo-Saxon period cemetery where people have placed enormous care in who's buried and how with what. We then can start asking questions about are families buried in clusters? Are people that have genetic relationships um, buried together? What does that tell us about the way in which um, communities revisited their dead who were buried in a place? Um, and so that's one of the things that I'm really quite interested in looking at. There's an, another kind of strand of genetic research that people are uh, developing now around disease. 
and the way in which certain diseases leave genetic markers in skeletal remains and allow us to explore the sequence not only of the individual but also of the disease and, and how diseases change in this period. So that really forces us to think a lot about who's arriving in Britain or what is arriving in Britain that brings disease. And that question, uh, which has been posed by other colleagues who are working in the field, is one that I want to explore with the materials that we have here from Croft Gardens. Our programme of research fellowships is one of the key ways in which we are able to um, provide opportunities for young researchers uh, to take the first steps on the academic ladder. And in, in the case of the Croft Gardens site, we could, I suppose, simply have, have uh, farmed out the archaeological dig to an external company, but it's in the nature, or it will be in the nature of this particular dig, uh, that it will be hugely interdisciplinary. It will involve you know, aspects uh, from the scientific side and approaches from the humanities side as well, and it's that kind of interdisciplinarity that Cambridge colleges simply um, exist uh, to, well, not just to promote, but in a sense, it's at the very core of what they are. So we took the view that the research potential of this project was such, and its potential was such also as to be able to draw on, not only on the interests and research specialisms of many other fellows in King's, but of fellows of several other Cambridge colleges as well, that uh, the right way to go about this was not to just let it go, uh, but to own it and uh, see the development of all the potential it has for new research, not only in the, 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 the very specific area of you know, studying the, the skeletons that have been uncovered, but all the possible spin-off research, all those things that, that would be possible if we turn it into a college research project uh, rather than something that's being done somewhat at arm's length. Another particularly exciting find we had was um, a small glass jar, I'm going to call it. Um, we, we called it the, like a little pig on site. It looks a little bit like a little pig with four legs or also hand grenade. It looks a little bit like that. Um, and we so rarely find uh, such amazing glass objects, like particularly as it is in great condition. Um, at first we thought we might, we might have found something uh, later, because you know, you get, um, there was quite a lot of disturbance on site from the buildings, but then no, uh, it was like in a, in a grave with like a, a Roman coin that had also, um, it had been pierced. So it suggests they've, curated the Roman coin, they've used it later to, to make a necklace or, you know, some kind of pendant. There, there was actually no body in that grave either, which was also strange. Another thing that was remarkable about Croft Gardens is the level of preservation was good. Um, often you, you get um, limited preservation if the soil is very acidic, particularly sandy soil. But um, at Croft Gardens, they, they were in quite good condition, but some of the younger skeletons there was very limited survival, just some of the long bones. And then there were some, some graves that we didn't find a body in. We just found the grave goods. This, this uh, amazing little glass jar was in one of those graves. Uh, so yeah, that was a particularly exciting one. I think uh, um, Irena, who was working on site, um, she's Italian and she, like none of us had seen anything quite like it before. And she, I think she texted a photo to her friend in Italy, who's a glass specialist, who also hadn't really seen anything like it. Um, but we think it's Roman. Uh, that's, that's the latest on, on that. You know, King's is absolutely committed to making it possible for anybody that we think deserves a place at the college to study whatever subject to be able to come irrespective of financial or educational background. And it's so wonderful that this, this generous gift that has resulted both in the discovery of this cemetery and will result in these new buildings, which by the way are being built to passive house standards. So they help us in our efforts to reduce our carbon footprint as we look to the future. That's one of the very important college initiatives that we've been developing lately.
Uh, but most importantly, the rental income that will come from the occupation of these buildings uh, will be used for a range of projects which are under the umbrella term, the Student Access and Support Initiative. So a, a huge range of new educational opportunities are made possible on the top, if you like, of the archeological study that's uh, fallen like a, a windfall into our laps. It's terribly exciting. For me, the fun part is just taking all of the information and trying to make sense in terms of what, what it means for the people who are buried there. You know, who are these people? Where did they come from? What relationships have they got with the other people in the cemeteries? What access did they have to other material? How are they represented in death? What does that tell us about who they were in life? So it's, it's really about the sort of the, the people within those cemeteries. And it's from the individual cemeteries that we then build up this picture of broader communities. So I'm very much interested in kind of bottom-up reasoning rather than taking, for example, a historical text and saying, well, what does that historical text written at this high echelon of society mean for these people down here? I want to start with the people down here and work it up in the other direction. The way I see it, you know, um, what's the point in doing all this archaeology if, if we're not going to kind of share it with people? It's 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 history it's it's interesting like it's uh, something that should be communicated and the local community they you know they're usually really keen to get involved what i hope that the the future inhabitants of the the buildings at craft gardens will be able to know about the the use and life of the site before they arrived is that there was a life before them that there's there's really extensive um, use of this landscape, uh, really quite fascinating and diverse uh, ways in which people lived in this landscape. Um, I mean, you know, from prehistory on, um, there is a long, long history of occupation of this island. So I hope that the, the really extensive work that we're doing at Croft Gardens and the way in which we're revealing not just um, kind of the raw data of who lived here when, but also trying to reconstruct people's ways of life will help people to, to reflect on the, 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 the diverse strategies that people have used to live and to thrive in this part of Cambridge. Mm -hmm.